Hi everyone. It's a real pleasure to be speaking with you all today at KohaCon 2020. Sorry I couldn't be there in person, but hopefully one day we'll get to meet up again. Today I'm going to talk about solving problems. Problem solving is a critical skill in any field and understanding the problem solving process is going to help make us and our teams more effective in the work that we do. So we all solve problems every day. We do this consciously and unconsciously throughout the day. Sometimes we do it alone and sometimes we do it in groups. Uh, for example, uh, you might engage in contract negotiations, which is sort of a very rapid problem solving um, process. Also, we do this with, within software coding. Uh, for example, a simple uh, process would involve do I use an unless or do I use an if, you know, and what are the, the benefits to, to either of those. Uh, sometimes even we decide where we want to go for dinner and that's a problem that we solve uh, sometimes. Do we want hamburgers or, or Thai food and we have to go through the process of coming to a solution to, to that particular problem. So what, what we're going to do today is explore this creative problem solving model. We're going to combine an overview of this creative problem solving model with information about people's unique preferences within that process. We're going to look at how you can identify your particular preferences, how to identify them in others, and how to leverage these preferences within teams to make us stronger. I will list some resources at the end of this presentation about the companies and individuals uh, that I'm getting some of this information from. Uh, the creative problem solving process in particular was uh, sort of outlined by two individuals in the 1950s and there's a foundation that they uh, created that continues to this day to promote creative thinking and trainings. The creative problem solving model is pretty straightforward. There are four steps. Clarify, ideate, develop, and implement. Problem solving starts with the clarify step, or essentially understanding the issue that needs to be addressed. It then moves to ideate, which is how we come up with the best solutions. And next we take those best solutions from our ideation phase, and we make them even better in the development process. And we usually select one final solution, which we then implement. And that's putting that particular solution into action. Let me take a moment here to kind of talk about this creative problem solving process. And this process, these four steps are played out as, at the high level. And then you can also play out each individual um, kind of cycle within each step. So for example, as you're developing a solution to your problem, you might encounter challenges that you may need to clarify. You might need to come up with solutions and ideate some solutions on. You might develop those solutions and then implement those solutions back into your final solution that you're developing. So each step in the process can have its own process within it. So that's very normal. So these things are, it's not so much that you do one and then you go to ideate, you do clarify and you go to ideate. You can sometimes circle back and incorporate some of the other steps in the process that you're at the step of the process in which you're at. So we'll go ahead and start by talking about the clarify step. The purpose of this particular step is to identify the problem, right? That makes sense. Uh, however, that's a little bit of an oversimplification of what goes into clarifying the problem or the challenge. Sometimes we know what the general problem is or we know what the unwanted outcomes that we're seeing and experiencing are, but maybe we don't quite understand where the problem actually lies or what it is that we're trying to solve. We're seeing sort of the secondary outcomes from it, but not we have to kind of dig a little bit to get to that root cause. Um, or maybe the challenge that we've established for ourselves is too broad. So for example, maybe we've said in our marketing meetings that we want to grow our company. That's a broad idea and that really requires us to narrow the focus so that we can hone in on the areas of change that we control. Uh, remember, the, the problem you identify needs to be something that you influence. It's 
hard to solve a problem that you have no control over. Um, you know, even in software, we cannot control how other folks are using the APIs and the problems that they may encounter, but we can control the APIs that, that we code. So how do we clarify? Well, clarifying is a lot like brainstorming. You start by asking some questions. What's happening? What is it that we're seeing that, that's, that's going on? Where is it happening? Does this happen over there? Does it happen over here? When is it happening? Is there a frequency to this that, we, that is going to help us identify what the problem is? Or is it a time of day or is it a, during specific actions that it's happening? And then also, who is it affecting? So gathering all the information that you can during Clarify includes all of the history of the issue that we're addressing, the facts surrounding the issue. This includes the feelings and perceptions of the people involved with this particular issue or problem. All of these things help clarify what the problem is that we're trying to address. It also helps to clarify where we have gaps in knowledge related to the problem. And with Knowing what the gaps are helps us ask more questions to fill those gaps in. And of course, spending time in this clarification phase really helps set the rest of the process on the right track. In other words, we know we'll be solving the right problem. So how do you identify a clarifier? Or how do you know if you are a clarifier? Well, first of all, clarifiers ask a lot of questions. And I mean a lot of questions. It's usually how you immediately identify that you're working with a clarifier. Clarifiers need all the facts. They need the history. They keep their eye on the problem. Uh, they, they want to explore the, the problem in depth so that they know that they are solving the right problem. Occasionally, uh, clarifiers are a little bit loath to move on to solving the problem because they want to make sure they're identifying the right problem. If you're a clarifier, it's important to learn how to identify that point at which you enter into sort of an analysis paralysis. Um, and at that point is when you, you have to learn to let the process continue on to ideation. So how do we leverage clarifiers? How do we work with them in teams? Well, the, uh, to work with a clarifier, you allow them to ask a lot of questions. The questions will help lead the group to a better understanding of the problem. All right, so now once we feel like we've clarified the problem, we move on to the next step, which is ideate. This is where we generate all of the ideas. In my experience, this is usually the most fun step in the entire process. I am not an ideator by nature, but I love the sense of play and opportunity that comes from watching folks who are really good at this step. And play really is the most apt word to describe this step. You can encourage this sense of play with your participants if you're facilitating an ideation um, session. Toys, flashcards, markers, whiteboards, sticky notes, apps like Padlet or Coggle, all of these things will help generate lots of ideas by seeding bits of information that sort of lead to other, uh, other bits of information in the ideator's heads to come up with solutions. And the goal here of this particular step in the process is to generate as many ideas as possible. Now, it's, with any play, there are some rules to the game. Number one, most important, suspend judgment on ideas. Some of the ideas that come up might appear a little bit unconventional. Let them go. Understand that that's part of the process, and we want to see what comes later after that. And it's just a way to clear the brain of that idea, write it down, and get to the next idea. We want to seek these wild ideas. Sometimes it's the wild ideas that um, give somebody an idea that sort of brings it back into the realm of, of uh, believability and, and actual, you know, practicality. We want to work at combining and building ideas. And again, so if that wild idea 
maybe doesn't work in its exact implementation as it's sort of discussed, taking it with another idea can lead to a third idea. And again, I can't emphasize this enough. The goal here is quantity. Quantity is what leads to quality. A general rule of thumb is that the first third of your ideas are generic. The second third of your ideas are probably the wild ideas, the silly ideas. And the last third are going to be the breakthrough ideas where there's true innovation that happens. And the trick for those of us who are not ideators is to be patient. Let the process play out and you'll be rewarded. Now, you're kind of thinking, what do I do with all of these ideas? We've got a hundred of them. Now what do we do? How do we pick them? We want to put these ideas through a funnel and get just the best ones out. And you can do this by organizing the ideas, like ideas with like ideas. Ten ideas that are really the same thing are one idea. And this is going to help get that number down. You can also set up some baseline criteria to help judge the ideas. Um, one of my favorite ones is always to say, is it legal? Is, will we get in trouble if we do this? Those are probably ideas that you really don't want to explore. Um, another one might relate to budget. Can we afford this idea? It might be a great idea, but if it's really outside the realm of what we can afford to do, then uh, maybe not in its current form. The other way to do it is to allow the group to vote. Vote on the ideas, get a smaller group, vote again on those ideas and sort of narrow it down. You might find that even through this sort of narrowing down of ideas, you'll still your ideators will still be generating ideas. Um, I don't like to lose great ideas, um, so I usually try to provide them a way to continue generating these ideas that's not going to derail the rest of the group. So by providing a notebook or a Google Doc, they're able to harness some of these ideas, uh, and then if something truly great comes out of that, you know, we can share that with the group. So how do you know if you're an ideator? I'll say you usually you know. Um, you always have ideas on how to solve problems, any problems. Sometimes you might even be solving the wrong problem with your ideas. Um, you might hear occasionally that people will say to you, well, that idea is kind of crazy. Um, if you come up with great ideas and it's easy for you, you're an ideator. So how do we leverage ideators if they are constantly coming up with ideas? The trick here is to give them specific problems to solve and then stay out of their way. Give them a lot of room to play. Throw a lot of random ideas or images at them if they appear that they are stuck and they will surprise you. Okay, and if we're now to the point where we've narrowed down our ideas and we have an idea or three, it's, you don't leave ideation with maybe just one idea. You might have a couple of ideas that you think are worth exploring. This is the time where we enter into the development phase. And the purpose here of the development step is to take these ideas and evaluate them, to strengthen them, and to identify a best fit with your organization, your workflow, your software. Spend your time here focusing on one idea at a time. One of the best ways to do this is to use a rubric of some sort. Um, I like PPCO. It's a nice mnemonic that I can remember pretty easily. It's a way to identify the pluses. What are the strengths of this idea? What's really good about it? Investigate the potentials. What are the opportunities that will come from this idea? What are the future gains that we could get? Where could it lead us? And again, this would be an area maybe your ideators would be able to help with those potentials to be able to see where the process might, might lead us. The next step here would be concerns. And what are the drawbacks or the concerns that, that you have about this idea? Instead of listing these concerns as problem statements, phrase them as questions. For example, how might we do dot, dot, dot? In what ways might we dot, dot, dot? Because when you phrase those concerns as questions, it allows you to think of the possibilities to overcome those concerns. So how do you know that you're a developer? Well, usually you probably don't enjoy the ideation phase. You, you really just want people to pick an idea. Just pick one and let's go with it. Maybe you get a little frustrated in that particular phase. 
once you're in the development phase and you have an idea, you might want to keep refining that idea. Um, developers and clarifiers have a lot in common, typically. Um, and much like the clarifiers get to paralysis analysis, the developers can too. They want to keep refining it. It's, it's real helpful to learn or to, to learn to trust the input from others when good enough is good enough. And when you've reached that phase, that's when we want to start moving back into implementation. Because chances are, if you've gotten it to the point where it's good enough, it's probably really great. And how do we leverage developers? These folks are processors. I say give them time. They need time to evaluate. They need time to consider the options. This is the group that will improve the plan and understand that their questions about the solution are all about improving the solution or identifying the issues that others may have missed in the previous steps. And they need the time in order for which to do that exploration. All right, so now we have a solution. Perhaps one of those has risen to the top, you know, through our um, analysis, through the rubric. One of those out of the three choices that we had in the ideation phase, one of those rose to the top and it looks like the really the best idea the developers have gone through it and said yes this is this is the thing that we think is is ideal for us this will solve our problems now we need to implement it this is the time for action uh, if you're a project manager this is what you've been waiting for this is where the project management tools come into play the change management tools come into play Make a brain dump of all of the steps that you need in order to move this solution into action. This is where the action plan and to-do lists are generated. The Gantt charts are created. The to-do lists are made. Tasks are assigned. It's important here to really leverage a lot of the project management skills and a lot of the change management skills um, in, your, in your team in this implementation process. As with most projects, there are going to be individuals who are going to assist with this change. They see the value, the benefit, they want to make this happen. There will also be those others who may resist the change. Uh, so learning to leverage your assisters to overcome the resistors through that change management process is really important and a key part of any implementation. So how do you know if you're an implementer or how do you identify an implementer? Well, implementers make things happen, quite simply. Also, if you've sat through this entire process with the creative problem solving process, you've probably been antsy and ready to go do something from day one in the process. You may also find if you're an implementer that the group's not working fast enough or making enough progress for you. Understand that you may want to rush the entire process and it's important to recognize that time is needed to allow for the incubation of great ideas. Remember, when a great solution is identified and it's developed fully, the implementation is way easier. So how do we leverage an implementer? Well, implementers need to know that the process is moving forward. So communication with them in a timely manner throughout the entire process is essential. So those four steps are what make that creative process, creative problem solving process complete. Uh, and we talked a little bit about how individuals can have preferences. In effective teams, we need to capitalize on the different preferences that individuals bring to the table. And this starts with number one, respecting other people's preferences. Um, and people can have more than one preference as well. So you may have one, two, three, or four preferences in, in the phase, in these four steps of the creative problem solving process. And remember that preference doesn't equate to skill. 
you have a preference for something, but there are still hard skills that can be developed to support that preference. And you may find that you have skills in one area that maybe you don't have a preference for because you've learned to build those skills. So preference is not skill. But we can create diverse teams by stacking the team with each type or with the skills found in each one of these four steps or preferences. A diverse team is going to provide a balanced perspective when solving problems. And understanding your preference, your individual preference or preferences also provides a big picture view. From my own experience, knowing that I prefer clarification and implementation totally explains why I naturally skip the ideation and development stages of the process. Now when I have challenges to solve, I seek out ideators. Coming up with ideas isn't my strongest skill, and really it is just loads of fun to watch ideators at work to see what they will do. And with the development stage, it's still not my favorite stage, and I've learned to have patience with it because I know that after the, that idea is developed fully, we can implement well, and that is my other preference. So for me, learning to have patience through the phases in which I do not have those skills has shown some benefits so that that process can fully play out. Creative problem solving is a great way to find innovative solutions and fresh perspectives to the challenges that your team faces. This model can provide some structure to solving problems and leverage the talents of all of the individuals on your team. Here's just some brief descriptions and resources for the creative problem solving process and the foresight thinking profiles that we talked about today if you'd like more information on either of those. And I want to thank you for having me here today. It was a pleasure to talk about creative problem solving. If anyone has any questions, let me know. You can email me. My email um, is joy at bywatersolutions.com um, or you can find me in the Koha IRC channel, the handle talljoy. Thank you very much.